Great. So it's a pleasure to have Katerina Graton joining us from her new home in Florida um, and to talk about uh, connectivity um, and even show us some, some code that she has and I'm uh, looking forward to that. And uh, she told me just before uh, we started here, it's okay to sort of interrupt with questions. So that uh, includes you folks on Zoom, just unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Folks here in the room, uh, if we get a little bit of crosstalk between that, that's that's okay. That happens. Okay, great. Without further ado, take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks for organizing. I apologize. I'm in a bit more of a rustic setup because I'm surrounded by boxes at the moment. Um, so let me know if my internet starts getting wonky or you can't see something, um, and I will do my best to try to improve the situation. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here today. I think this Neuro Academy is like such a cool service that Ariel and, and everyone puts together. Um, so I'm happy to be part of it. Um, and just as he said, I, I'm happy to make this a little bit more conversational if there are specific topics that you are, you know, already have some experience with and you wanna dig into them a little bit more deeply or they're new to you and you have questions that I'm not answering, just feel free to um, interrupt me. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as much as I can. I think Ariel said he's gonna keep an eye on the Slack as well. Um, so just whatever method you feel most comfortable asking questions. Um, and I'll just sort of overview that I'm gonna start off with kind of a very, very general introduction to functional connectivity and why you might think about using it as a way of measuring brain function and brain organization. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more in detail about some of the work that I've been particularly interested in or doing in my lab. Um, and then I'll close off with this uh, uh, tutorial that is up for you all to try out and I can overview what's in the tutorial and we can walk through some of the steps. And, and again, you can do some of that on your own as well and ask questions as you have them. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. I'm currently still uh, affiliated with Northwestern University, although I, in the, in the next couple of weeks, will be uh, officially over at Florida State. I'll kind of keep an affiliation at both places. Um, and I wanted to start the talk just by thanking all the folks that have sort of contributed to the work that I've done or have collaborated with me, um, in particular my lab that's listed there, um, because sometimes we get rushed at the end and I don't have a chance to give them their proper dues. So I just wanted to put that up here, um, as well as our funding sources. And I also wanted to say that as I'm moving to Florida State, if this is work that interests any of you, uh, do feel free to reach out. I'm re recruiting at multiple different levels within the lab uh, from uh, grad student, postdoc, perhaps some RA positions as well, or if you know anyone who might be interested, let them know. And I've got contact information up there. Uh, both for recruitment, but also if you have questions later that you want to sort of reach out with, um, feel free to use that. Okay, so I thought I'd preface this presentation by noting that we uh, historically in neuroscience, there have been two very different ways of looking at brain function um, that are kind of pit, pit, pitted against each other in this uh, presentation as shown here. So on the one hand, some work in cognitive neuroscience is really focused on trying to understand what are the specialized functions that different brain regions have within them? What are regions say, you know, it might be specialized for specific aspects of visual processing or motor processing and so forth. Um, and on the other hand, you could also look at the brain not by focusing on the functions of individual brain regions, but instead on by focusing on the interactions between different brain regions and this sort of distributed processing perspective. And of course, you know, as the history has moved on and perhaps not surprisingly, what we end up finding is that both perspectives are valid perspectives on the brain and give us new insights. And it might be useful to sort of understand their interactions between each other. Uh, but for the purposes of today's talk, this is going to focus more on uh, understanding coordinated interactions between different brain regions in opposition to the sort of more standard task fMRI evoked signal responses, which typically focuses more on specialized processing. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be three main sections to this talk. The first is going to be this general background on functional connectivity. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of our work looking at individual brain networks using these uh, so-called precision fMRI approaches, and then I'll introduce the tutorial at the end. 
Um, and I'll just sort of mention that if you were sort of wanting to look ahead at the tutorial, you can access it in a variety of ways. I think this will probably be um, old news to all of you who are already a, a day or two into Neuroheck Academy, uh, but you can do it through the Jupyter Hub, through uh, GitHub tutorial links as shown here. I will mention there are a couple um, elements of the tutorial at the very end for visualizing the uh, graphs that I think are prettier versions of visualization that use the free software Gephi. So if that's something that you're especially interested in, I'd encourage you to download it now just to be um, ready to do that later on. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started with functional connectivity. And so the way that um, I'm going to be talking about our measurements of uh, brain signals right now is primarily based on fMRI and specifically the blood oxygen level dependent or bold signal, which tends to increase with in increases in neural activity. And one of the reasons that I think it's really useful for measuring these interactions between different brain regions is because it gives us uh, an estimate of brain activity all over the brain approximately simultaneously. So that makes it really well suited for measuring these large scale brain networks. But of course, there could be other properties of these networks that you might be interested in. And in fact, a lot of what we'll talk about in terms of the mathematical sort of um, ways that we measure these brain networks can be equally applied to many other types of neural signals, uh, whether they be from non-invasive uh, measures like EEG or MEG or more invasive measures like ECOG, optical signals, or even single or multi-unit electrode recordings. And some of you may be interested in that. If you have questions, I'm happy to sort of discuss my expertise is more on the fMRI side, but I'm happy to chat a little bit more about what it could look like in these other domains. And so when we measure the brain networks, uh, what we do is we're typically just measuring a relationship in the activity patterns across different brain regions, some sort of measure of statistical association. And this is often called functional connectivity. You may have heard this is kind of a controversial term in the field. A lot of people are just like, why don't you call it, call it correlations because it's correlations and that's fair. Um, typically um, what we do is we measure just the correlations and the bold signal between different brain regions. Although I'll point out that you can also measure the statistical association in other ways, such as with coherence, PCA, ICA, and so forth. Um, and so what does this look like? Um, so if, for example, we take the bold activity and left and right motor cortex over time, you have these two time series. And what you might be apparent just by eye is that they look very similar to one another. So they're very highly correlated with one another. Whereas a region that's part of another system like left visual cortex may show a much more distinct pattern with much lower correlation. So this is kind of cool. Um, what was surprising, I think, when it was first observed by Biswal and colleagues in the 90s, uh, is that this is true not just when we ask people to complete a motor task, but even when we have people staring at a fixation cross sitting as still as possible, even in those moments, the left and the right motor cortex are very highly correlated with one another in what's called this resting state. And in fact, the pattern of correlations in these uh, spontaneous activity from during rest mimics the pattern of evoked activity you might get in different task contexts. So for example, if you ask people to do a finger movement task, you get evoked patterns of activity in the same system of motor regions that you are correlated with one another spontaneously at rest. And this is true not just for those motor regions that I showed you on the previous slide, but many different systems spread throughout the brain. And we can measure all of them and represent them at once in a single format, uh, which is called a correlation matrix. So here, any given cell in this matrix just represents the correlation between a pair of brain regions. Now here, the pattern is randomly arranged. I think I just random sorted it um, before I put it onto this graph. And it's hard to see much of a pattern. It's a little bit snowy. Uh, but if I reorder the uh, regions such that I put the ones that are part of the same functional system close to one another, you see this really beautiful structure emerge. So you can see that there are high correlations along the diagonal and low correlations in the off diagonals, um, so, so, which is called a block diagonal structure. Now, because of this, we can really effectively use a number of different algorithms to identify uh, communities or subnetworks within this graph. Uh, within this uh, correlation matrix. Uh, so uh, I've used one technique here, which called the InfoMap. I'm happy to discuss the merits of the different ones at some point if anyone's interested. Um, and I'm just marking off with red lines the different um, 
systems that it identifies in this sort of data-driven manner. And you can also do this uh, for every single unit, every vertex or voxel in the brain um, and paint it on the brain in different colors as shown here on the left. So I'll just pause for a second and point out that I think this is pretty neat. So here we've used these spontaneous uh, activity patterns of the brain and these data-driven clustering algorithms. And we can get this really detailed representation of what networks look like in the brain, representations that both match some of what we already knew about brain organization, presence of the visual system, motor-related systems, and also allows for easy identification of systems that might be harder to find in, in, with other means, such as default mode system, frontal parietal system, single particular system, and so forth. So I think that's pretty cool and, and, uh, and exciting to many folks. I'll sort of warn you though, before we get overly excited that we should be cautious about these types of measurements for a number of different reasons. Um, be, first off, because these are sort of these observational signal, uh, signals, there's not like an experiment per se in it. These are uh, an unlike in tasks where we have moments in time that we've constructed um, there's no external imposed perturbation on the resting state signal. And that means that we have to be really cautious about other forms of variability that can uh, influence this signal and make it look like things are more or less correlated than they would be otherwise. And some of these have been studied in more detail than others. I'll sort of just remark on a few of them that you might be, want to be particularly aware of. Uh, one of these, which is sometimes uh, a bit ignored, is sampling variability. Uh, so just like any other type of statistic that you get uh, from the population, there's going to be some error associated with that statistic. And you usually need to have a fair number of samples in order for that error to go down. And the same has been shown to be true of functional connectivity. So that the more time that we collect from any given participant, the lower the error on our measurement. And so this is something to sort of be cautious of that we're gonna have often very noisy measurements, especially if we have shorter segments of data uh, from a given participant. Um, and so you should be aware that there are things that may appear, appear to be variable in really interesting ways may only be variable because there's noise in the measurement itself. So that's sampling variability. Um, there are also other forms of variability that are biased in different directions and can be particularly pernicious for that reason. Um, and one that might come to mind if you've been working in fMRI at all is motion, of course. Um, and then respiration more recently has been recognized as a big uh, uh, biased signal within functional connectivity. And so there are a variety of different denoising techniques that people have developed to try to address uh, the impact of motion and respiration on functional connectivity signals. I'll just uh, put up a couple references here for you folks. Um, sorry, blocked it off. Um, so that you can uh, that very nicely compare some of these methods to one another and how effective they are at removing the biases that in particular influenced by motion and some of the recent power papers also by respiration. And so you might use these to sort of select the best denoising techniques for your particular um, data set. And I'll sort of warn here that one of the reasons that this is so pernicious is that when we then compare individuals to one another, of course, different groups might differ systematically in the amount of motion or the amount of respiration that they have in their data. And so this can be related to other variables of interest. And then the last one I'll mention is, that also has an influence on functional connectivity is arousal levels inside the scanner. Uh, so as you might imagine, sitting there staring at a fixation cross is a really boring task. Sometimes people even have people close their eyes and sit in the dark. So a lot of folks might drift off to sleep, but maybe other folks don't drift off to sleep. And um, sleeping in the scanner, while you still find the same general resting state networks during sleep, it does systematically change the functional connectivity architecture. And so um, this may be what you're interested in. You want to study you want to study functional connectivity changes with arousal, but if it's not what you're interested in, you may want to sort of consider how that could impact your data and, and consider different um, approaches you might use to try to address arousal inside the scanner. And again, I'm happy to chat more in detail with anyone if they are interested in, in sort of our different approaches that we've considered within our lab. All righty. So, um, I'll just sort of pause and say, those are a lot of sort of negative notes about functional connectivity. I think it's wise to go into these sort of studies, uh, being aware of the 
difficulties that there might be with measuring these large scale brain networks. But I'll also kind of return to the point that despite the lack of constraints, sort of again, these data driven um, methods on these spontaneous signals with these other sources of variance, there is a lot of systematicity to this um, signal. And so one way that you can see this is by comparing two large group data sets, one of which on the left here was collected at WashU. This is, I think, about 120 individuals at rest. And this is about 1,000 individuals who were collected at Harvard. And these were you know, different people collected on different scanners, and they used different clustering techniques to identify the networks of the human brain. And yet you can see there's a lot of commonalities uh, between these network decompositions across these different methods. So it suggests to us that there might be this sort of general principles of how these systems are organized across the brain. And I'll sort of hint at the next section by saying that we and others have also shown that with enough data from individual participants, you can produce really reliable maps of what these networks look like, even for single people, a few examples of which are shown here. And so, sorry, did someone have something to ask? Okay, I'll keep going. Feel free to interrupt. There'll be a natural pause point pretty soon so you can ask questions there. Um, so I'll sort of also say that one of the advantages, although I've uh, sort of pictured this just as these static images of what these networks look like um, on the brain, is that we can also use these to try to understand the complex systems uh, level organization of the brain. So we can go from this anatomical view of which different regions are part of which different systems with different colors. And we can move to this sort of graph view as I'm showing you here, where now each individual region is represented by one of those circles, which are called nodes. Um, and then uh, functional connectivity between those different uh, regions are shown by those edges. And here we put a threshold. So we say you have to have higher than a certain uh, functional connectivity value to have one of those edges between the different brain regions. Um, so here I'm still picturing in approximately the same like anatomical layout. It looks a little messy. It might be hard to see things, uh, but we can move one step yet further forward into one of these uh, spring embedding or force embedding layouts as shown here, where now I've moved the nodes around on the graph such that I position them to be most close to, uh, with other nodes that have many edges to them. And so uh, you can see that this has sort of changed the perspective that we have a lot on the, the brain relative to this first picture. And in particular, I'd like to emphasize kind of two things that you can now see with this new image. One of them is that you can see properties of the graph as a whole. So for example, you might notice that whereas before it looked like a mishmash, there are all the colors tend to cluster with one another. That is, there is this network organization where some nodes are more tightly interconnected with one another relative to others. I've just sort of highlighted a couple of them here. This is the visual system and this is the default mode system. Um, but the other thing that you can also uh, find in this graph is that some, you might sort of guess that different nodes will have different properties relative to one another based on their position within this complex system. So for example, you might find some nodes that seem to lie there towards the center and have connections maybe with multiple different networks. And you might ask, do these nodes have special properties for how information is maybe transmitted across the large scale uh, brain networks? And so, Hopefully this gives you sort of an overview of the different types of things you could uh, do and ask with functional connectivity. And I think it's led to a lot of excitement in the field about our ability to use functional connectivity to address questions such as how these networks are impacted by different forms of brain damage or disease processes, how they may differ across individuals and perhaps linked to individual trait-like characteristics, how they may change over the course of the lifespan with either developmental or aging related uh, properties, or how they may differ across different cognitive contexts or with different cognitive demands. And so I'll sort of leave off here and before I sort of get into the next part of the talk to see if there were any questions about that background. See Ariel moving, I think. You all are very small, so I apologize if I can't see you very well. Hi, um, and maybe you don't want to get into this, but I was curious if you could speak to, like, um, when you were discussing limitations of functional connectivity research and, like, 
that there's methods your lab likes to use to address these and if you maybe have like a few favorites that you want to share. I'm happy to share mine and this may also come up a little bit in the tutorial later on. It's certainly a very uh, heated topic. People have very strong opinions on uh, different ways, uh, different methods. Um, to address sampling variability, our lab just tries to collect as much data as possible. You can probably ask Zach if he's there, uh, but we collect hours and hours of data from folks um, as much as we can. Um, and so that really helps to reduce the error that we see for individual participants and helps us to get those accurate and really reliable um, pictures that I showed you earlier. Uh, for the motion and respiration, the things that we've found most effective in the lab, uh, we tend to follow the Power 2014 uh, pipeline uh, that's published in, in his paper. Um, and in particular, I think the two steps that are really most important out of that are to global signal regression. That seems to be really important for addressing respiratory, respiratory related effects um, and um, motion censoring. So getting rid of those high motion periods, um, that seems to be important for removing the distance dependence of uh, motion effects that we see. There are other kind of related techniques that do similar things. You can kind of see that here in the CIRIC image that I've shown you, um, you know, in, in addition to sensory and spike regression and so forth, um, and other techniques that maybe address one of the two, but don't necessarily address both in combination. Um, and, you know, I could talk probably for hours on motion and respiration. It's probably not the most interesting to most of you, but if you have specific questions about um, techniques you've considered, I'm happy to sort of go over it um, or, or address those in more detail. Hi, I have a really specific question. Um, I'm a grad student working with Deanna at UCSD. And so specific to the InfoMap algorithm, I'm curious your thoughts about how much the uh, networks are detected by the algorithm versus what's really happening over the course of development and how to like deal with those effects. Um, I guess, are you just intending to say that like, if we use uh, networks that have been defined in young adults, can we use them for children or are you saying can we use InfoMap equally like in de novo to define new networks and kids? Yeah, the, the latter. If we can use okay. InfoMap, like if that the mathematical equation happening in the InfoMap algorithm is lining up with what's happening across development properly. Yeah, I mean, I guess I haven't really considered places where it might not line up. So I'd be curious about your thoughts. Let me, I can jump. I had some of this in the tutorial later, but since we're talking about it now, I think we can just jump forward. Um, and so there are like, you know, a few different ways. There's a class of different ways to define uh, networks, uh, communities within graphs. And if you're interested in investigating other alternatives, I would suggest you to look up this Fortunato paper. I think there's actually a more recent version. So it's like a huge review of different community detection algorithms in graphs, um, which I think is really useful. It sort of walks you through what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these different um, techniques. And one way that I think is perhaps the most commonly used in cognitive neuroscience, maybe I'm mistaken, um, uh, is one class of ways is based on what I would call modularity maximization. And so modularity, Newman's modularity is just a statistic that you can take that tries to quantify the extent to which you have connections within a given system relative to their expected value. Uh, and so this is the actual equation. You can sort of write it out and calculate it. And you can use then different search algorithms to try out different what's called partitions or divisions of the graph to say, does this improve modularity and kind of walk around or whatever that space and try to get the highest modularity that you can get. Um, and that works pretty well. Um, and I've used that in the past. Um, the recently we've switched to using InfoMap based methods. Sorry, one second. I have this in here. More. There we go. <laughs> InfoMap based methods, which are slightly different. So this is an information based uh, approach. And so what you do here is you have a random walker and you have them walk around the graph. And then you try to create this code that can express the, the paths that the random walker took. And you 
try to express that code with the fewest bits possible. And so the sort of key to this, I think it's called like a Huffman algorithm, honestly, I'm not an expert on this, is that you can reuse some, you use the most commonly traversed bits, uh, you give them the shortest names, and so that it has the lowest information. And you can do this at two different levels. So you, um, you can reuse names across different communities to try to reduce the information uh, that's taken to express these bits as well. And if you're interested in that in more detail, uh, this link down here uh, has goes to the code for the InfoMap uh, approach. And, and there's like a paper as well from PNAS that um, describes it and it's really downloadable. Um, so I guess what I would say is, in, you know, that's the general background on, on those two approaches, at least as they're used. Um, in my experience, in all honesty, I think they both InfoMap and modularity maximization often approach uh, come to fairly different, or, sorry, fairly similar solutions um, on uh, functional network approaches. They have, you know, pluses and minuses for each of them. Um, the in the sort of graph theory world, uh, some folks have started fa favoring InfoMap because, it, in theory, um, with modularity maximization, there is a little bit of a bias towards having communities that are all the same size, uh, which InfoMap seems to not share as much. So when it's been tested, for example, on toy networks where there are very different size uh, graphs, InfoMap seems to do better. And so in that sense, that's why we use it because it sort of gives us a little bit more flexibility in finding different size networks. Um, so I guess in that sense, I would also think that maybe within development, it might be a good approach in terms of not requiring or not restricting uh, what you're going to see uh, within that network in the way, say, a template-based approach or uh, would, um, and it would allow you to find these small and uh, larger systems. But is there something else that you and Deanna have been considering within the lab that you think might work better? I'm happy to hear more about it and read more about it too. I realized earlier also on the the methods uh, approach um, the question I didn't never got to the arousal question how we address arousal within the lab I only talked about the first two and the short answer to that is that we do very short relatively short resting state windows we do five minute scans we check in on arousal levels at the end of that and we also put a camera on folks eyes during rest um, and record uh, eye closures and try to monitor for that and give them sort of longer break if they seem to be closing their eyes and throw up scans with sleep. Um, obviously there may be even better methods, you know, gold standard would be to put some EAG on them and actually record their sleep levels. We don't do that uh, routinely, but I think that would be a really cool approach as well. I think that was the Th those were the questions here in the room. Are there questions from Zoom? Anyone want to un unmute themselves and ask? I think you can keep going. Awesome. Okay, so the second part, I'm going to uh, treat myself, at least hopefully it'll be a treat to all of you, to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing on individual precision brain networks um, within the lab. And um, I'll sort of start off by situating this again within the context of how do we go about thinking about how do we address all those exciting questions that I posed at the big at the end of the previous section. And in a lot of traditional fMRI studies, what you might do is you have this new study of this question and you would bring in maybe 30 participants or so and you'd collect an hour of data from each of those participants. Um, but we can also think of using that, you know, the total number of hours of fMRI data in several different ways. Um, of course, as many of you may uh, already be aware and, and Angie may have talked about earlier in her section, many folks are uh, pushing the number of subjects. So saying, 30 subjects is really not gonna be enough to answer a lot of between subject questions. We need to get much larger sample sizes. Human Connectome Project really started this um, a, a number of years ago now and, and the UK Biobank and ABCD and so forth are really pushing uh, the numbers on, on how many subjects can we collect to address, robustly address these brain behavior questions. 
Um, but another approach is actually to sort of turn that on its side. And instead of collecting a little bit of data from a lot of participants, we'd collect a lot of data from a fairly small sample of participants. And I'll show you, uh, hopefully, the next few slides why you might want to do this. Um, but this, I just sort of want to define here that this collection of lots of data from a smaller sample of participants is what we uh, often call precision fMRI or has sometimes also been called deep fMRI or uh, hypersampling. Every, everybody has a different name for this. And so um, let me uh, first introduce a couple examples of these precision fMRI data sets that we found particularly useful in the lab. Um, one is Russ Poldrack's MyConnectome data set. Uh, so this is data collected on himself twice a week for a little over a year, uh, resulting in uh, more than 80 sessions of rest mean state fMRI, as well as a, a number of other phenotypic variables. Um, and so that, that's the MyConnectome project. Um, and then another data set that, is, uh, that we've used quite a lot is the Midnight Scan Club data set. Uh, this was collected at WashU uh, at midnight, which is why it's called Midnight Scan Club data set. The scanner was discounted 90% if you were willing to excuse me, use it at midnight, which as you might imagine was very attractive to people without much money. So they were able to collect this uh, data set as a, at a fraction of the typical cost. Um, so it can, includes data from 10 participants who each came in for 10 functional MRI sessions. They also have another couple of anatomical uh, MRI sessions. And during each of those functional MRI sessions, they completed four different tasks as well as a resting state scan. And so both of these data sets are available on open neuro. So they're nice in that sense. They're easy to get into and play around with. Um, and I think they're also just nice examples of sort of start, starting uh, places where you can play around with what this precision fMRI data looks like and what it can do for you. And so let me give you some examples of what I think you can do with precision fMRI. Uh, and so one of the things that I think is really nice about this approach is that it improves your measurement of brain networks. And so what do I mean by that? Um, so one thing that it can do, and sort of harking back to the point I made before about sampling variability, is that it really increases dramatically the reliability of your data. And so this was first shown by Tim Lauman using Russ's MyConnectome data set. Now, if you took this huge amount of data, 80 sessions worth of data, um, and you split them in half, and you, in this case, I think ran InfoMap on each individual half and, and looked at the similarity between the two, you can see that's very striking high similarity. So it's not that this resting state stuff that we're measuring always has to be inherently noisy. In fact, if we collect enough data, we can get a very reliable measure of a particular person's functional connectivity signatures. And so he did this other analysis where he took, uh, you know, he took one half and set it aside and said, this is my best estimate of what the brain networks are. So we're going to set this as the gold standard. And we're going to ask how much uh, data we need from the half one to get a reasonable estimate of half two. And so as you get progressively more data, you can see you get progressively higher correlation to the other half. And around 30 minutes, you start to get close to that asymptote. You really are hitting it around 100 minutes of data. I'll note that this is for cortical uh, networks. So there are, this isn't true necessarily for subcortical data. So uh, Deanna's lab, as you may be well aware, you'll need a, more data most likely for subcortical um, regions. Um, and, and also specific to sort of this functional connectivity measurement. So may, there may be differences for other types of measurements that you uh, go about uh, getting. But you can use this data set to sort of try to infer what, how much data you would need for your other data sets. Uh, so this is true in one person, Russ Poldrex data. Um, we have now replicated this pattern across a number of people in the Midnight Scan Club data set. Um, and you can see here that you can do these sort of measurements, not just for the correlation matrix as shown here, uh, but also for network assignments, as well as some of those graph metrics that I introduced earlier. So that's pretty cool. So I think it increases the reliability of your brain networks. Um, the other thing that these approaches can do is also increase what I would call the validity of these approaches. And in particular, it does so because you can define individual specific brain networks and brain regions using a variety of different approaches. These ones are using uh, resting state-based parcellation approaches that have been uh, sort of led by Evan Gordon, shown here. And when you define individual specific brain networks, you can show that these individual specific locations defined at rest 
do a much better job of mapping, matching that individual's task-based activations. So for example, for these motor related regions, if you ask people to sort of move their tongue or move their hand, you can see that the evoked signal matches pretty nicely with their individual resting state networks and matches much less well with um, other participants. I don't have that shown here, but each individual's pattern matches their own pattern and matches and doesn't match other people's or the group average nearly as well. And this is true for motor networks, but it's also now been shown to be true for a number of other network uh, uh, contrasts as well that have been looked at. Okay, so uh, that's pretty cool. And I think I'll just sort of point out that I think that you know we can make these conclusions about motor and visual networks, but where I think it will also be really powerful is in other regions of the brain, which are really argued over. One of which is the dorsal anterior cingulate, which has maybe the most different functions ascribed to it. I'm just showing you here a sample of the different types of things that people have said that dorsal anterior cingulate does and, and what their activations look like in neurosynth. And indeed they look like they're smeared across this broad swath of cortex. Um, but what we can see is that in the group average, there are multiple different networks here. And if we look in individual participants, these networks don't align exactly across participants. They differ somewhat in their uh, location, which means that most likely when we're doing these sort of neurosense or group average analyses, we're mixing networks across different people and mixing different forms of specialization. So it's hard to make uh, conclusions about, you know, this piece of the brain does X thing without knowing that it's the same piece of the brain across different people. So I'll sort of argue that if we really want to improve our ability to look at the brain and also relate the brain to behavior, we need to increase the reliability and the validity of our measures, and these approaches can do that. Another thing that I think is cool about precision fMRI is that it allows us to study basic properties of functional networks that we might expect to be shared across many different people. One way that we looked at this is to ask about the temporal variation in functional networks, uh, in particular, ask the question of whether or not functional networks are relatively more state or trait-like. And in fact, you can think of this as existing really on a continuum of variation. So on one extreme, you might think, you know, the systems level organization of the brain should be invariant. Everybody should have exactly the same. Everyone will have the visual network, motor networks, and so forth. Um, and there should be no differences. And the only differences we measure are because of noise. But on the other extreme, you might also equally validly think, oh, our neurons are firing at different rates at different moments in time, we're doing different tasks. And so these networks should be constantly changing uh, in response to that. And indeed, you could also think that they would change over the course of minutes, hours or days, weeks or years, or maybe they're not changing within a person, but that they're very meaningfully across different people. And so I think this is an important question, not just for you know asking it, but also in terms of how we interpret resting state fMRI differences, um, whether or not they're tracking with ongoing thoughts that a person is having, or if they're a better measure of something stable about that person that will be meaningful at other moments of time. Um, and this in turn might tell us about the applications of resting state, for example, if they're better, if they might serve better as sort of ways of, of um, decoding something about a person's thoughts or some, or as a biomarker that could be used um, in a clinical setting. And so to address this question, we use that Midnight Scan Club data set that I mentioned earlier, which again has those 10 subjects that each came in for 10 sessions and they each completed four different tasks plus rest. Uh, the tasks were a semantic task where participants were asked to meet, use a noun verb judgment. There's a dot coherence task where participants were asked to um, say whether or not dots were arranged concentrically on the screen. So motor tasks for participants were asked to move their hand, foot, or tongue. Um, an incidental encoding task in which participants were asked to categorize faces, scenes, and words um, that were unbeknownst to them repeated over time. And so with this design, uh, we can now ask for, look at kind of properties that are either common across this full group of data sets or selective to particular people, to particular days, or particular task states. And so we uh, measured one of these functional correlation matrices from each uh, person, each day, each task state, some examples of which are shown here from two different people in the two different rows. And then we compared them to one another in a number of different ways. I'm just gonna show you one today so I can tell you about other stuff as well, uh, which is to say that we made another matrix, uh, but this is a second order matrix. So here, any given cell now represents the similarity between a pair of those correlation matrices or connectomes as sometimes people call them. 
And so what would we expect to see in the data? So let's just look at a couple schematics. Um, factors that are shared across the whole group of participants should increase similarity across this whole similarity matrix. Effects that are specific to a particular individual will be seen on this main block along the diagonal. And effects that are specific to a particular cast state will be seen in this little mini block along the diagonal and the off diagonals relative to that. Um, you might also get interactions, so effects that are specific to a particular person and task, so in the single mini block along the diagonal, or a particular person and session, the sort of checkerboard pattern. So if we return to the actual data, what we end up finding is actually a mixture of these different effects. Um, and so you might notice, for example, that the background is not centered at zero, but rather around 0.5 or 0.6 correlation, indicating that there is indeed commonalities across all of these networks. Everyone is sharing some general properties of their brain organization. Now, relative to that background group, uh, commonality, what you probably also notice is this really prominent block diagonal. So a given person's brain networks look most like themselves, regardless of what day it is or what task they're completing. There is a small effect of tasks. So say everyone doing the motor task looks a little bit more like other folks doing the motor task, but it's a bit hard to see on this color scale. It's pretty small. Relative to the individual effect, there's also sort of a modest interaction between individual and task. You can see sort of some of these mini blocks along the diagonal. So a given person doing, say, the motor task will look most like themselves doing the motor task relative to other tasks. Um, and there is a um, minor effect of individual and session. So, you know, they'll look most like themselves from day to day, but again, a little bit hard to see on this color scale. So I think there's two things that we can learn from this analysis. The first is that much like other papers have sort of suggested, we can find examples of each of these forms of variation in functional connectivity. And even with, uh, we can identify them as significant with just 10 participants when we use this really high precision fMRI data, which is kind of cool. Um, but the other thing that I think is also really noticeable is that these effects vary substantially in their magnitude such that most of the variation or most of the uh, similarity in these matrices can be explained by stable factors, group commonalities or individual specific features, and more transient factors from task or day-to-day -day variability tend to be substantially smaller. Interestingly, the largest are actually interacting with those individual features. And so I think this uh, tells us that functional networks are primarily stable, so that sort of um, addresses how we might interpret resting state functional networks. Uh, not entirely, but primarily, um, and thus may make them particularly well suited for clinical applications because of their stability and their sensitivity to individual differences. Um, there are also a number of other cool things that we can learn uh, by using precision fMRI techniques, and I'll just highlight a few that um, I've liked in the literature. One is from Rodrigo Braga's work, who's used these sort of approaches to show that the deep, the what we call the default mode network actually seems to break apart into two parallel networks that seem to lie very close to one another um, and often are mixed together in group uh, studies. Another from Scott Merrick uh, in the cerebellum and Deanna Green um, is to look at the uh, networks in the cerebellum and show that the frontal parietal network seems to be expanded relative to other networks there. And also from Deanna Green to look at subcortical uh, networks in the thalamus and basal ganglia and show that you can find both network specific but also integrative zones when you look within single individuals. Some of these are shared across people and some of them are not. And so I think this is cool. Um, also because we can use these sort of approaches to study the characteristics of individual differences in brain networks. And um, you may uh, have noticed when I showed you examples from the participants in the Midnight Scan Club that although they seem to share some general properties, they also differ a little bit from one another and from the group average. And so in a project uh, led by Ben Seitzman, we looked in particular at these locations that seem to differ the most between any given individual and the group average. And so you can create for each person a map of how similar that person looks to the group average at each particular point. So you create a seed map, say for this location and that subject, and you compare it to the group average. And if they look similar, you give it that nice warm color. And if they're dissimilar, uh, you, know, you give it a, a lower color. And what you find is that many regions of the brain look similar to the group average, but each person seems to show these uh, punctate locations that are really dissimilar from the group average that are less than 0.2 correlated with the group. 
And these are locations that we call network variants. And across a number of different analyses, we've shown that these locations are very stable over time, even uh, over years, um, and that they seem to be connected to differences in how those regions respond during tasks and also to small differences in behavior uh, measured outside of the scanner. And then I'll point out that uh, just like I introduced at the very beginning for functional connectivity in general, that these approaches can also be used to improve our understanding of the complex systems uh, or organization of the brain and how it may differ across individuals. So for example, Evan uh, in the original study for the Midnight Scan Club created this spring embedded plots for each individual person based on their individual uh, brain network organization. Um, and you can then compare across different people and note that some of these seem to have somewhat different shapes from one another, and that corresponds to different properties of these uh, in these network graphs. And interestingly, you can also use this to then define uh, brain hubs that may differ in location slightly across different individuals, but be important for transmitting information across those systems. Okay, so I know that was like a whirlwind tour of many different uh, projects, but I'm happy to take any questions now that you guys have on precision fMRI or we can move on to the tutorial if you don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we have a question from Bram. Bram, where are you? Would you like to ask? Um, hello. Um, you mentioned that the, a certain number of minutes, I think you said something like 30 minutes or so, or 30 to 60 minutes, um, give you optimal results for uh, in terms of reliability for a scan. Um, I was just wondering, does, does it matter if you take that uh, data, the, that scan data from a single scan versus uh, just taking a couple, you know, one minute from 60 different scans, let's say, in terms of reliability? Um, yeah. yeah, great question. Um, so Tim Lemon did an analysis kind of related to this in the original paper on Russ Poldrex's data set. And in general, the answer is it doesn't seem to matter too much. You can break it apart. And that's partly why we've moved to not doing like a single 30 minute scan, but rather doing these five minute chunks uh, because they're better tolerated by different folks. Um, there will be some limits on that. So I, I think I wouldn't go below two or three minutes, um, partly because of like filtering, at least if you want a bandpass filter, then once you get to really short periods of time, that starts to be challenging to do. Um, and if you lose some data due to motion within that scan, that gets even more challenging to do. So that's why we sort of settled on five minutes being a good amount of time. It's not too long and not too short. Um, but yes, I think you can effectively split them apart. And, you know, that might even increase reliability. There's uh, certainly if you randomly sample and Zach can tell you about his work, I don't know if he's uh, going to be talking about it more specifically, uh, but if you randomly sample time points, you actually tend to get this sort of paradoxical much higher reliability than if you consecutively sample time points because of autocorrelation in the bold time series. And so you might see that as well in uh, your data. And I think that can be an effective strategy. And I think Stephanie Noble and some of her work has also shown that if you sample those sessions, if, you have, if you're lucky enough to have people coming back multiple times and you have them for multiple different days, that might even sort of be better than sampling five minutes uh, consecutively across the same day. I, Karina, I, I have a question, uh, sure. which relates to the interpretation of the stable versus varying um, connectivity. Which is mm -hmm. you point out in in your in your results your your interpretation if I understood it correctly was that there's a lot of evidence for these kind of relatively stable um, network properties and then you point out that you know task above and beyond sort of the the baseline is just a very small effect but it seems like the the to me it seems like the comparison to do there is between individual and individual plus task because you remove the individual variability right the the fact that task doesn't add much might just tell you that the alignment between individuals is not that is not that great, and the within subject design is the right design to evaluate the you know the task effect itself, and that that effect is very large actually in your in your graph or you know relatively large. The individual by task interaction, it is it's it's certainly not as large as the sort of individual effect by itself, even across different tasks, but I agree it's not to be completely ignored either. Um, 
And this is something that actually um, grad student in my lab, Lex Porter, has been digging into. She just had a paper accepted cerebral cortex um, using sort of machine learning methods. And she had this really nice um, approach where she took initially the midnight scan club data we now replicate it in another data set from our lab and she took they had 10 sessions she takes nine sessions and trains a classifier to decode which task someone is doing and then just on that person's data and then she tests that classifier on either the 10th session from that particular person or a 10th session from another person and so the ability to sort of uh, generalize to new people or, or be specialized for a particular person can be sort of determined based on the accuracy of this um, performance. And much like we saw here, what we end up finding is that there is this sort of individual by task interaction. So you can classify task state from functional connectivity uh, quite well with uh, um, both approaches. And you can you can use the individual's data to classify in a new person, but the accuracy is not amazing. That's maybe like 60% which is similar to what you get if you use a cross subject approach, at least in this data set with similar amounts of data. Um, but within a person you get a, above 95%, you're doing much better. And so you could ask, is that just because their anatomy is, you know, their, their, the location of their functional areas is slightly different. And so within a person you're capturing that in a way that you're not able to do across different people. And we've done both in, in my project as well as in her project, we did try to do um, a control analysis to test for that. It's a little bit hard to map functional areas across the brain, although there are some cool techniques coming from Thomas Yeo's lab and Matt Glasser to try to do this. Um, but we did this at the network level. Um, so it's not that hard to identify the frontal parietal network, the default mode network, et cetera, et cetera, in each person. And so you can end up with these uh, 10 by 10 or so matrices, 12 by 12 matrices. Um, and then do the same sort of analysis. And what we see there is that it's surprisingly not, the effects don't change that much, even when you match to each individual person's function, a frontal parietal network or singular particular network. So it's not completely explained by the differences in where the functional areas are across people. There seems to be something also different that's happening within the task within each person and how they're using these areas. Um, but yeah, I think there's more to do and, and doing this at the sort of aerial level would be even uh, even a better approach. Hi, Katarina. Um, I just, it may be a naive question, uh, but uh, I mean, if the interesting aspect is the uh, those specific uh, regions of, I mean, variability between subjects and, you know, individual differences, uh, then I mean, the, the, the use of those things is really in relation to uh, behavior of some, some uh, individual you know, uh, characteristic of the, of the subjects. But, but if you do have only 10 subjects to play with, uh, how do you actually as, as address that you know, more interesting question that just you know, you know, verifying that you can you have it, indeed differences between subjects? Yeah, and I, I think that's a great question. And I think one that many people have been talking about, we've, we wrote a little commentary on this for based on the BWAS paper that came out recently. And I think there's, I, may, I maybe have two answers to that, maybe more than two answers. The first is that I'm not sure, well, first, the, I guess the first answer is that I think these approaches with 10 subjects can help us improve approaches with larger sample data sets where you might be better powered to look at these cross subject effects. I agree that you're gonna need large samples to look at between subject effects for most things. Um, and so the, some examples of that are, for example, now that say we know that there are these two default mode networks, say that Rodrigo Braga has identified, we might be able to create better templates or better approaches to identify those in large samples, even when we don't have the same amount of data. And I think there's already some hope that, you know, there's some promising work in that direction. One thing that we've often done is sort of pair our smaller sample data, like the Midnight Scan Club data with Human Connectome Project data, and sort of try to then see if the principles that we see in the Midnight Scan Club then work uh, in a larger sample data set after we sort of convinced ourselves that they're present in the precision fMRI data. But the other um, aspect to that question is also, I think that we, um, I don't know that I would agree that the interesting answers or the interesting questions are always between subject questions. I think there are many interesting within subject questions and even the in the clinical sphere, which I think often pushes between subject questions, trying to look at between subject variation, um, there are many of the sort of intervention type approaches that we might use for treatment, for intervention, and so forth, are really within subject questions. How can we 
changed something for a particular person, what has changed recently in this person to make them feel better or for worse. So I think that we should also focus on the value of these within subject questions, these sort of precision techniques for tracking them. Um, so hopefully that sort of gives my view on, on sort of two of the things that I think precision fMRI can bring to addressing brain behavior relationships. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't see any more questions here. So, oh, actually, I do see. I'll come back up there. Looking at the individual differences, are you assuming that everyone is going to be identified at the same resolution limit when you're looking at some of these community detection algorithms? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, the approaches that we have, um, so there's obviously many different levels at which you can look at brain organization and, and sort of there's to some degree a hierarchy, although that may break down sort of at some levels and you might define where that is. Um, we have typically, we have like a set of thresholds that we tend to look at that seem to do a good job of producing somewhere between 12 and 15 networks. And Thomas Yeo, of course, in his work has often focused on like the seven or 17 network solutions. And those are sort of the range that a lot of people look at. But you're you're completely right that you may have, you may uh, see different things depending on which level at which you go. And the different community detection algorithms that you use have make different choices on how to parse that apart. Um, so for example, the modularity maximization approach as well as InfoMap, um, the way that they, they don't require that we predefine how many networks are present um, in the system, but they do require that we predefine thresholds at which we, um, we threshold the original matrix and input it into these algorithms. And usually that's what, where we sort of see the resolution-based differences. And we have tended to go to relatively low threshold, the, the lower the, um, sorry, the sparser the graph, so the higher the threshold, that you go the sort of more broken apart the networks uh, and the smaller networks that you tend to see. Um, but then some of them don't sort of um, match onto networks. So we use sort of a range and try to group across to the smallest but reliable pieces that we've tended to find. Um, and Evan Gordon's pushed this even further in some of his recent work, uh, looking at sort of subnetworks within, I think, the default mode and now other systems as well. Um, but I think it's a great point that we might see certain types of individual differences at different resolutions um, within that network. Um, I believe Rick Betzel has a nice paper sort of thinking about this and talking about this. Um, and so it, it isn't necessarily the case that the same thing that we see with like a 12 network solution will be what we see at the five network or a 20 network solution. And I think now there are no more questions. So I think you can go on. Awesome. So I forgot exactly how much time you gave me, Ariel. I don't want to keep everyone way late, but the last section of oh, the yeah, tutorial. You have, you have 30 minutes more. Perfect. OK, so this last section is a more hands-on tutorial. So I have some slides. I can walk you through it, but I'm also really happy to take questions and sort of um, go through things as people find useful. But let me just introduce the tutorial so you know what you're looking at and sort of what you might expect to see. Again, here are all the links for folks. Um, leave them on the screen for a second in case anyone needs. Does anyone need me to put these into a chat or something? Yes, okay, let me. There's no chat on the Zoom, so you, you'll have to put it no in chat. Slack. I can put it in Slack. One second. Just Slack? open it up. I turned it off so it wouldn't beep at me constantly, but <laughs> now you guys can listen to it too. <laughs> Maybe. Stop sharing just for a second. All right, here are the links for folks. I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Um, does, I can go through them um, if, if folks have questions or? Uh, I think I think we already con you know, conveyed those to you. So okay, perfect. All right, so 
let me go back. Actually, I'll go back to my slides for a second, then we can go to the actual code. Okay. So I'll just sort of introduce what you're going to be looking at here. And so there's a notebook that kind of goes through four main different ways of looking at resting state fMRI data that I think are useful at different stages of your project. Um, and so the first is a very um, let's clean our data and look at data quality sort of stage, which is to look at gray plots and how you might construct these. I'll tell you a little bit about what those are and, and what you're looking at in a second. The second is creating correlation matrices, although it might seem relatively simple to create these matrices, the ordering and a sort of the depictions of them can be really useful. Um, so I put some code in there that might be uh, helpful for you. Uh, the next is to create these sort of spring embedded layouts of the graphs this is where you might use Gephi or you could create an uh, the outputs in any other graph visualization technique that you like. And the last is to think about these different types of hub measurements uh, that you might make from uh, complex networks as well. So I'll go ahead and start with uh, these introducing this idea of the gray plots or car carpet plots um, in more detail. Uh, so these were developed, at least as far as I know, initially by Jonathan Power. He has a whole paper just about a figure, which is something I want to have at some point in my career. I think that's kind of amazing. Um, and you can read it. I think it does a really good job of describing why these are useful. Um, they've now been incorporated in a variety of different tools. So for example, fMRI prep has uh, versions of carpet plots that they uh, produce automatically as well that you can visualize. But I think for my personal, preference. It's also nice to have code to create these yourself because then you can customize the code to include whatever might be of interest. Um, so let me introduce what one of these looks like to you and why you might want to customize it. Uh, so the heart of the gray plot or carpet plot is this part of the this subplot of the figure right here. Oops, sorry. Something exciting for the dogs out there. <laughs> um, a second. Okay, so the heart of this plot is this, uh, this piece right here. And so what this is showing is each different row here is a, um, a, per, a time series from a particular brain region, usually like a voxel. Um, and you might sub-select the voxels. You don't necessarily show every single one, and, um, but kind of do that randomly. And um, so on the x-axis is uh, time. On the y-axis here, they're just stacked relative to one another. And the, it's shown as a gray plot image, so you can see the intensity as it varies over time. And so that's for the gray matter, and then you might also show white matter and CSF below that, typically. And then above that, you often have time series that might be related in some way to properties of noise or artifacts that you might see in your data. Uh, so very commonly in these plots, you might show some measure of motion above it. Um, so here I'm showing you the six original time series uh, for this participant from this scan um, in the three different translation directions and rotation directions. And then in red here is the frame-wise displacement calculation, which just is from frame to frame, how much did the, how much did the head move um, relative to the previous frame. Uh, so that's a common uh, way of identifying motion. And I've also put in a black line here for the threshold that we might, for example, typically use as saying this is too much motion and we'll reject a particular frame of data. Um, then you might have other types of measures here. So for example, in uh, blue here is uh, the DVARS measure, which has sometimes been proposed as a way of denoising data, which is a measure of frame to frame bold signal change as a whole. Um, and then in green is uh, the global signal um, at this particular stage of processing. Um, and so I'm showing you this here. This is how I like to look at it, partly because we've noticed some uh, idiosyncrasies in the motion parameters themselves and uh, particularly multiband data. So if anyone's interested, I can talk a little bit more about that. So I've tended to now include these in the gray plots as well. Um, but you could also put any other thing in these subplots, right? Like you could put your time series for your task. You could, or uh, you could put your respiratory belt data. You could put anything else that you think might be related to this gray plot data, and use that as a way of sort of assessing the the 
quality of your skin. And then typically, I guess, when you're looking at these gray plots, the things that I tend to look for are these vertical lines, which usually mean there's a signal change that's kind of shared across many different voxels of the brain. And you can see that many of them tend to occur at the same points as these high motion periods. You might also look for horizontal lines. Those could be signals uh, that there's some regions of the brain that have some problem with them and that they're consistently giving like a flat signal relative to others, uh, to other regions too high or too low. Um, and I think those are the most typical that I've at least looked at in here. Maybe other folks have other things too. All right, so let's go to the actual code and create some of these. Oh, and I forgot to notice there's one other thing that it's also important that you scale this data to uh, set value because that can be informative, right? Because if they're outside of the typical range. And so typically I've scaled this to plus or minus 2% signal change. Um, so you say, make it mode 1000 normalized and then scale in that way. So just a, a small note on that part. Okay. So I'll go to the notebook. Hopefully it all works right away. Can you guys see that? Okay, great. Um, so I'll just sort of run through the first initialization bits, um, setting up your organization, you can turn on or off different sections if you want to um, later on, um, less important in a notebook format, but I've also used this in a straight um, script format. Um, so hey, uh, Karina, this, um, I think you have no kernel right now. So I think you want to restart the kernel first. Oh, thank you. Yep. Good. <laughs> All right. All right, so this just is gonna be code that um, allows you to make the gray plots. And you'll notice that it actually calls on these functions that I made um, over here. So you can feel free to dig into those. I just wrote a, a bunch of dictionary with a bunch of different um, uh, functions that are useful for making gray plots and you can change them as you want for your own personal uses. What I'm doing here in the first one is I'm actually plotting out a gray plot for each separate stage of pre-processing that we use in functional connectivity data. And I think it's useful to often show this at different stages of processing because it gives you some intuition of what your pre-processing is actually doing to your data. Um, so I'll walk through this. This is for one, subject one, session one uh, in the Midnight Scan Club data set. Um, and first off, you'll notice there's nothing here in the gray white matter CSF because this is not even demeaned or detrended. So um, until you denoise the data, that's not actually a super useful uh, stage to look at it. Um, so, uh, stage two, uh, what's called stage one here is the uh, demeaned and detrended data. And so this is kind of, uh, relatively raw depiction of what your data looks like before any of the true functional connectivity pre-processing uh, happens. And you can see there's a lot of these vertical lines, the stripiness um, that maybe isn't what we want in our actual data. Um, this next stage is where we do our nuisance regression. And so I, as I mentioned before, we do the power 2014 um, processing um, strategy, which does uh, regresses out global signal white matter CSF, um, as well as motion parameters, uh, their uh, squares and the sort of expansion terms versus an expansion terms. So this what's called the 36P approach. Um, and what you can see, hopefully, if you go back and forth between these two is that between the first and the second, there's already a lot of the vertical lines have been removed just by doing this nuisance regression. But there is some remaining junk sort of left in, it's particularly associated with these high movement windows. And so uh, the next stage is actually uh, interpolation. So what we do is we take out those moments uh, that were deemed based on our FD cutoff as being bads, we censor them and we actually interpolate the data in between. Um, and then I'll, you know, we can get into this in more detail. We use a power spectral matched, matched form of the interpolation um, just to 
better match the uh, frequency spectrum of the data so that later we can do band pass filtering. So that's what's shown here. And so if you go back and forth between these two stages of processing, you'll notice, of course, that everything is smeared out more in time because it's been band pass filtered. Um, and then the last stage, which I don't think we actually need to do, but it's just standardly in here is to demean and detrend the data again. Um, so that's what we do in our data. You could use this for your own processing stream and look at it at, at different stages and see how well it cleans up your data relative to what you'd expect. Um, once we do this, we take out these pieces that we censored. Um, we don't use them in our actual functional connectivity analysis. And then we use that to create correlation matrices. Um, I'm probably not going to do this right now, but you're welcome to do it on your own if you want, but it's, you can just create gray plots for many different sessions. Uh, so you can look at how people or days vary from one another. Um, one thing that has been noticed by many folks is that people who are high movers in one session tend to often be high movers in other sessions. So these are correlated with one another, but not exact. You can still find lower movement time windows. Um, and in fact, also there seems to be some genetic component to it. Twins are more likely who are, uh, to be similar on their sort of motion metrics than you would expect, uh, or identical twins than fraternal twins and so forth. Um, yeah, and then there's a bunch of references that I've included here if you're interested in sort of these questions and digging in a little bit more deeply. Uh, also thinking about other ways to more quantitatively assess how well your data is removing motion artifacts. Um, Maybe I'll pause here and see if anyone wants to get into that. Okay. Assuming not, I'll keep going. You can always ask me questions later. Um, so the next section is to um, create these correlation matrices and later these spring embedded plots. And so I'm just gonna load the data from the different subjects. Do this uh, Fisher transform of the data. So it just spits out some divide by zero errors, but don't worry about them. Um, and then we can create some correlation matrices. And so I'll show you uh, the creation of the correlation matrices with the 333 regions that I've given you. These are the Gordon 333 parcels for anyone who's familiar with that. This is a group um, de parcel definition, parcelation. Um, and for each subject, we uh, mask out their high motion frames and we use this group network assignment. Um, and so of course there could be other ways you might do this. You could use individual parcels and in network assignments. Um, and there are different ways of sort of defining individual specific regions. Um, I haven't walked through that in this um, presentation. Are you are you all doing another one? Because I feel like the last time I was at Neuro Academy, there was one on individual parcelation. We are not. Okay. Not this time. Well, feel free to ask me questions. I can walk you through it conceptually as at least. I don't have slides on it, unfortunately, but um, there's, you know, many different techniques, functional anatomical, group or individual sort of, that have been used to define um, individual regions. And if you have questions, especially if you're like, ah, I'm debating between X and Y, I'm happy to give you my thoughts on that. Um, but yeah, so let me just create the correlation matrices as shown here. I'm just gonna start with a group matrix and I'm just gonna co compare again, just like I did in my presentation, a random ROI order, hard to see much, don't despair. If you put it in an order that you would expect, this is just the group average order, even and this was a group average um, order defined based on those 120 individuals at rest, which have no overlap with the midnight scans called participants, but you can see using that group average order already produces this really nice block diagonal structure in the group average of the midnight scan club, even though it's a separate data set. Um, and so that's the group average. Um, and then you might compare how individual matrices look relative to that. So the next part just walks you through creating some individual correlation matrices. There's just gonna be a bunch here. Um, I might just show you the figures in my presentation because it'll be an easier way of looking at it, but you can feel free to run it and play around with that. Let me just. Uh, 
Um, so here we go. Um, so here are uh, several different subjects, core subjects, for example, um, with their particular correlation matrices. And you can see that they share, you know, they seem to kind of have the block diagonal structure, um, but they're each a little bit different from one another. If you look in detail at the different blocks, you'll see, you'll notice some patterns that seem to be different. Uh, for example, look at this block and the subject has kind of these clear squares that you don't see in the other subjects. And one thing that you'll notice though, if you look at the same subject over time, their pattern looks relatively consistent. So this is sort of similar to the effect that I was showing in the paper earlier, that a particular person looks very much like themselves across different days. And so we talked about that earlier. Um, we can then quantitatively sort of assess this and create that similarity matrix. And so that's gonna be the next section of the code is just to show you making a similarity matrix. So you can see, you can create this for yourself. Um, and you might notice again, that really prominent block diagonal. This is only resting states. It doesn't have the task data like in the figure I showed you earlier, but you can see it shows a different, a similar pattern, sorry, across uh, resting state sessions, across different days. They're much more similar uh, within a person than across people, although there are commonalities also across people. You may also notice the stripiness for subject eight. Um, so this is something that comes up if you ever use the Midnight Scan Club data. It's actually a subject we usually toss out because they fell asleep during uh, most of the Midnight Scan Club scans at midnight. So they were pretty high movers and had you know arousal differences. And so um, you will you may notice this as well. So it's definitely dependent on data quality. Um, also in the other subjects, these ones usually tend to be higher movement sessions where they lost more data. All right, any questions so far on these? Just a sec. Um, I have a quick question. Um, I'm asking from Zoom here. <laughs> I'm wondering um, how common it is um, as a practice to generate like the null distribution. And, and I'm wondering since they're individual subjects, would you compare the null distribution to each of the individual subjects? A null distribution for what, I guess? I, I, I mean, guess I like think... for uh, the correlation matrix. Um, I guess, I think it, I think I would have to think about what null you're trying to test against. Or if, if the null is the question of like, does this person vary more than would be expected by chance from like a group average matrix? Is that sort of the question or yeah. is the question that, yeah, I don't know that I have seen that sort of null created very often. Um, I I think it would be interesting to sort of set up an approach like that. The thing that we've had more experience with is thinking about variability over time within a person. So I think you could, you know, use a similar approach uh, there. And we have created, um, in that case, a null of what we think a static connectome should look like and sort of asking the questions of whether or not the dynamics that we see over time are more than would be expected from a static connectome plus noise. And I think you could use a similar approach to saying this is what a group average looks like. Is this more than we would expect from a group average? It's noise. I think it would be a really cool thing to do, but we haven't done that. I see. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, it might be very basic, but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, so like I see here that your data, you have uh, like dot ma uh, mat files. So like, how did you get them? How did you process them? And because you, you didn't convert to uh, from the NIFID file. So you probably did some parcellations on that file. And Good question. Yeah, so this is uh, more of a historic thing that my lab uses MATLAB and not Python primarily, which I shouldn't say too loudly, but I'm now saying to the entire audience. And so there, um, but there, um, you know, I, I think that is a good question of like how you would you might store it within sort of uh, the NiPy framework, um, and maybe I'll pass that off to Ariel, who I know has like a nice connectivity toolbox as well. 
All right, I think the audio just cut off a little bit. Uh, I didn't get the whole answer, but oh. I think <laughs> you, you may share like this uh, pipeline afterwards. Yeah, I mean, so this pipeline is, uh, it's on our, most of it's on our website, but it, I guess what I was saying and uh, is that we do this in MATLAB. So that's why they're MAT files because they were stored in MATLAB. Um, and so that their endpoint of um, code that was run there. Ooh, I see I'm very low on battery. One second, I'm gonna move over as I talk. Um, but the I was gonna say, there's no reason that we couldn't do this in Python. This is mostly just wash you use MATLAB primarily. And that's the postdoc lab I came out of. So we're using MATLAB for a lot of this pre-processing. Right, Hopefully that you. answers that. <laughs> it does, thank you. Okay. You're connected. I can hear you. One second, sorry. I'm trying to connect battery. Can you guys still hear and see me? We can. We can uh, definitely hear you and see you. Okay. Hopefully, it's not too bad. I moved back to the other room that wasn't working before. But <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yeah, let's see how it works. Okay. Yeah, and I don't. I don't see any other questions at this point. Awesome. So as you can see, you know, these aren't, these are relatively simple approaches, but I think they can be pretty illuminating uh, about your data. I mean, another thing that you'll notice, you won't notice as much here because these are high data um, data sets, but that if you have less data from a person, what tends to happen is that this matrix starts to look just really spotty, like it's just very noisy. And so one of the things that you, I think, uh, that becomes really apparent as you increase the quality of your data, the sharpness of this sort of correlation matrix that comes out. Katerina, sorry, your, uh, your, uh, audio, your, audio, is, Katerina, your uh, audio is really, really cutting off. Could, Play around with even just this code and create. Can you guys still hear me? I feel like it's. I'm no, yeah, your okay. audio is is cutting off quite a bit. Okay, back to the other room, but I'm just gonna grab the power cord and find a place to plug it. In. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, right not a problem. Feel free to explore and think about it for a second as I do that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. We haven't unpacked any of our extension cords is the problem. <laughs> I'm gonna sit here, see how that works. <laughs> and and you can actually you can you can uh, you can keep your video off and uh, that might work what better in terms of saving bandwidth. Wait, is this okay? How's this working for you guys? <laughs> it's working all right, I think. Okay. I'll try this. <laughs> um but yes, let me know if it stops working. Um, I don't know where I may have lost people before, but I guess I was just saying that although these are simple ways of looking at your data, I think they can be really useful ways of looking at your data um, because you know they can show you first off problems that occur in your data, as well as um, providing kind of a quick intuition of things that are might be happening in there. All right, so it sounds like no more questions on correlation matrices. Um, I guess the main thing to think about as you create these correlation matrices are kind of higher level questions. Um, what order do you want to put regions in? That matters a lot for the patterns that you see. You can compare just between these two to see that. What regions do you want in the first place? How do we define networks with the resolution of the networks that sort of come up already? Um, and so those are big questions that I don't think have like a single right answer, but are worth sort of thinking about and tackling within your own data. Um, so I'm going to move on to um, the spring embedded plots. And so for this section, I'm actually going to be using this other third party sort of visualization software because I think it looks nice. Um, I have in the past coded this both in Python and in MATLAB uh, to create my own little graph. So it's certainly possible to do. They just don't look as pretty. Um, so I'm providing instructions for how to use Gephi. Um, but feel free if you would rather have something more automated, um, which certainly is useful at, at certain stages of the project, um, to, to look those up um, and use those tools as well. Um, and so this is the, um, this in this section, we're sort of going to, um, here, 
uh, load the matrix and then we have to threshold the matrix. And so I mentioned earlier that for creating those plots, usually what we do is each region is one of the nodes in the plots and then connections between the regions as defined by functional connectivity are the edges. And you can use approaches that will use what's called weighted edges. So they use all the edges and they change say the thickness based on the values. Um, but more commonly, I think you would threshold that matrix at some level. And that thresholding can happen either at a set correlation value, like you can say, I'm only going to trust correlations above 0.3 or 0.5 or wherever, or you might do it at what's called an edge density or uh, sort of um, value, which gives you a certain proportion of edges out of the total that could be in the graph. And I've, I've tended to more often do that approach where you have a certain proportion, because then when you compare across different people, you have the same number of nodes and edges, um, because that might matter in terms of changing graph properties in and of itself if they differ in their number of edges. Um, so what we're going to do here is first create um, a group matrix uh, at a set threshold. So if you're for example, at 2% threshold. So it's just going to go through and threshold the matrix uh, to create this thresholded version. It's an adjacency matrix. Um, and then it's going to create just some output CSV files that are what Gephi expects to read in when it wants to make these pretty pictures. So let me just run this. And then it's just going to output all of these CSV files for you. And then I put in kind of hopefully detailed enough instructions here for you all to actually use Gephi to do this. Um, and just in the interest of time, I had it already loaded for us to look at. Um, let me just see if I can do that. All right, and share that screen. Okay, and so um, one of the things that we can do here when, let me just start, actually, let's start again. Sorry, one second. I think it's useful to see it before it's been made into a graph. <laughs> Sorry, you'll see I'll follow the instructions too because I don't do this often enough that I remember them, which is why I write everything down because <sighs> uh, otherwise I won't remember it the next time I do it. Oops. Okay. So, Sorry. The first thing that you have to do in here is to load the nodes and the edges. Find the actual instructions. Um, and you do need some of the plugins. If you haven't loaded the plugins, you'll need to do that. So you just go and you import the spreadsheet. Katrina, we're, uh, we're not seeing your uh, screen right now, if you intend yeah. to share. I do intend to share. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to read through my instructions at the set for how to do this. So you're going to import the spreadsheet and select the node file. I think I should have this open to the same place. The node data, because I'm using this group average uh, approach, is going to be the same for every subject. Um, so that won't change. If you had individual specific nodes, then you might have different node data right, for each subject. And the one thing that's a little clunky here, there might be a different fix, but you have to change the, I forget the color column to be a string if you want it to produce those nice pretty colors that you saw me put in there. Uh, yeah. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt here, but I think something's wonky about the UI in Gephi so that when you only share Gephi, we actually don't see the UI at all. Um, oh. So I think if you share your entire screen, we, we will see better if you don't mind doing that. Yeah, no problem. Do that. Share screen. Desktop. All right, can you guys see it now? 
Yes. Maybe. Okay. And so, um, this is uh, the one thing that I think the instructions say is you have to make sure your colors. Maybe this is going to work. Maybe not. Um, to in the way that I've uh, that we've sped it out. Then you append the notes. Say okay. Maybe it'll work. It's working before. <laughs> Even a little bit slow. So hopefully this will work. I'll keep trying. And then you also have to add the edges. So file. There we go. Import spreadsheet. I think it's the same, just edges for this one. And we said we would do the group average and we'll do 2% threshold to spat out a bunch of them for you guys here. Open. This one, the only thing you have to remember is uh, you want to append it to the same workspace or it'll make a new workspace for you. Okay. And then you can ignore all the errors. Maybe. All right, and then as you color the nose, I press the little end button with a color, press that, and I'll make these beautiful colors. Okay, make these beautiful colors and it looks like a mess, right? So we haven't done this for anybody. And so it's just loaded all the information. And so you can then run the different embedding layouts. Um, and you can try different ones. Like you could start with a circular layout and see what that looks like to you and run it. Oops. Zoom is all weird and um, I'll go to the preview button because it looks better on the Zoom. You can use the middle mouse button for this um, within Gephi to zoom in and out, but otherwise, maybe. Zoom very slow. I said this would work, but it doesn't. I'm sorry, <laughs> give it a minute. Forget there's like a hotkey for zooming out here. I can't show it to you, unfortunately. Oh, there it is. Okay, anyway, this is a big circle. I unfortunately don't have the zoom on just my uh, laptop, but um, this is a random circular layout. You could give it specific layouts. So what I wanted to show you is that if you do the force atlas and you run it, it will do this nice pretty picture where it's now making those graphs like I showed you before. Um, and you can run it for as long as you want. You can kind of see that it's reorganizing itself. There's different types of layouts. The spring embedding layout comes from the name is like in visualizing the edges like springs where you wanna minimize the force on those springs. So that's why you put things kind of close to one another that have edges between one another. Um, there's other force approaches as well that kind of have a similar principle that you just wanna minimize the force um, that's holding these springs apart. It's just a visualization approach, but I think it's a useful visualization approach because it shows you the data um, in this way that kind of um, emphasizes these different properties of it. And so the overview tab lets you play around with different properties. And then the preview tab it will eventually show you like a final publication worthy picture perhaps at some point in time. We'll give it like one minute to do it. And otherwise I'll just switch back and show you the ones that we plotted out previously. And in the meanwhile, if there are any questions about this or any other things. Can I just ask a general question regarding the pre-processing? Um, so because you have like small N numbers, but you have multiple scans, do you ever find that um, the pre-processing uh, that you do using all these components, do you ever worry about power um, as far as controlling for all these components? Do you mean like power in terms of 
like when you're doing the uh like um so for instance like 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 the, the power component out lots of different things or power in terms of like correlating brain and behavior more in term uh more in terms of the former um okay i'm sorry i think that my internet cut out but i think you're saying more in terms of like we progress lots of things out and how's that affecting like the power in, in terms of calculating the correlations perhaps um and that's yeah. i think I think that's something that it's important to be aware of but each of the times that we're regressing things out or cutting out time points that's gonna reduce um, the number of independent variables that we have for computing correlations. But I think that's where the approach of having lots and lots of data from individual people might have because of, of those questions. But I think actually when we have less data, it's something that I've been concerned about quite a bit of data. You really run into issues where some folks are at the limit of what you can really regress out from your data because they just don't have that much independent time points and you start to get really wonky things happening in your correlation matrices. Um, hopefully they answered your question. Yeah, I think I got most of that. It was a, cutting in, in and out a little bit, but I think I got most of it. Thank you. <laughs> Can we um, this doesn't seem to be happening. So I'm just going to stop this Skeppy yeah. approach, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're, uh, we're actually, actually kind of oh, a, a time also. I'm sorry. So <laughs> And no, no worries. Yes. Uh, your your internet is, is seeming to try to, to kill and and see if that. It's not happy with me. I'm sorry. Um, maybe trying too much from a not pretty house. Oh, apologies um, for the end of that. But hopefully it was useful. Um, and maybe it's enough. I can just show you one last thing quick and then we can call it a day. Can you guys still hear me at all? I'm killing Gaffy because I think that. Yeah, you're very, problem. you're very choppy. Maybe. Well, let's, uh, you probably have a slide okay. there with a beautiful Gaffy plot on it. I, I just want to show this one to just emphasize. So these are Gaffy plots. Um, one of the things I didn't show you, but is in the tutorial and you can play around with is that you can, um, Co color it in different ways. Um, and so, for example, you can use this to color the high degree nodes, nodes that have high participation coefficients, so what we might call connector hubs, things of that sort. And so that can be useful as well. So just as a visualization, just like with the other ones I was telling you about, play with them and make them kind of your own and make them useful for you. And so hopefully Giphy will work better for you than it's doing for me right now. Um, but yeah, let me know also if you have any questions or you're not able to get things working and I can help you sort of um, push through that as well. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Karina, for your time and uh, all that. Yeah, I'm sorry for the internet connection issues. Apologies. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I think we can continue this discussion on Slack and then we'll, we'll take a break over here uh, until 6.30 Florida time, uh, which is 3.30 our time. And then uh, resume, I think with another person from Florida. I think we're, we're all in Florida all, all week. Thanks again, Katerina, uh, for, for the presentation and lecture and, and see you soon. Bye all.